invariably you're collecting information about partners, spouses, children, um, because they're all part of what makes somebody's financial situation. You can't split them all off. <laughs> they don't divide that easily. So, a lot of this, just determining what the financial situation of an investor is, is pretty obvious. You would be surprised how rarely it is done well. A number of well-known traps. Um, somebody may be entitled to receive a certain amount of money in the future, five or six years' time. Or indeed, the opposite could happen. Um, I know in this part of the world, it's very common and fashionable to send um, young people to university abroad. That's a commitment coming up down the road, several years down the road in many people's cases, but it needs to be budgeted for and needs to be part of the financial advice process. And if I can run the risk of quoting Ronald Reagan and a few other his politicians who've used this expression, um, I would urge upon advisors to trust and verify, by which I mean it's all very well to trust your clients, but do please insist on documents. Not necessarily from them. Many clients don't like handing over documents, don't have the paperwork. Uh, do please get authority to obtain the information from third parties, if at all possible. Because if you don't have the hard copy version of the loan which you're giving advice about, how do you know the loan actually exists? It might not. How do you know the terms of the loan? Client might have got it wrong. And if you give advice and get the basic facts wrong, then the client has every reason to say you didn't do your know your customer work properly. And there are some legendary uh, cases where this has gone wrong. Um, advisors blamed for re making recommendations uh, as means of paying off loans <coughs> in certain situations where they magically failed to have a look at the loan document and the loan never existed or it was of a different type that didn't require that type of investment or savings vehicle. These things happen more often than one might think or the loan amount was wrong. Most clients really don't know these things or don't keep them in you know, at the forefront of their minds when they've got other bit things on their minds. So do please have proper files, proper records of the basis for your advice. When we look at goals, um, it's all very, one of the big problems that all of you face, I'm sure, is the client that would love everything. You know, they'd like to have really much more income and not risk their capital and uh, not take any risks with their capital, and it all gets a bit silly. And one of the areas where good financial advisors really earn their money is in actually helping clients to understand which of their goals they can actually realize and which ones they can't. Some regulators, with much good reason, want advisors to focus on the time scale of investments. There are situations, though, when clients just have some money to invest and really don't have an objective in mind. They just want to get wealthier and they don't need to spend the money. Uh, but fundamentally, if you don't have some sense of time, you're unlikely to have any to get the investment recommendation right. But inevitably, concerns about objectives lead you to attitudes to risk. Uh, does the cust can the customer cope with the risk that you're going to need to give them in order for them to achieve their objective. If not, you need to reorganize that objective. Uh, and above all else, if the customer can't get what they want, they can't afford um, to pay for Johnny's education in America, does it matter? Does it matter fundamentally? In other words, can we take a risk in trying to reach a target that would otherwise not be reachable knowing that actually, if it isn't reached, we can cope. But attitude to risk is really where the discussion begins, middles and ends, usually. Um, the classic way to do these things is to take a table and go, one to ten, where are you? You're a six. Um, I hate being called a six. I don't know about you, but um, I think that's totally the wrong approach. If we actually look at what risk really is, or what attitude to risk is, which isn't the same thing. It's probably 
your feelings about losing one of a number of things. Capital. All of it. Do you need the money available? Do you need that level of income? Can you cope with less of it? We've already met. Can you one of can you meet can you meet cope with the risk of not meeting your objective? You know, do you actually have a lot of extra income coming in which could actually pay Johnny's university fees in America through another means? Do we have an overall general approach to risks or investments that we feel comfortable with? The sort of investments we feel happy we are able to tolerate? Well, perhaps we do. Perhaps an advisor can say that after all this discussion, you are sort of, you know, a bit middle-ish, you know. Well, if they do, have they bothered to discover whether you mind going above or below that level? See, I might say to you, I'm happy to have... In to invest in individual equities, okay? Am I interested in investing in a hedge fund? Well, it might be, or it might not be. Some customers, you might say, well, we put a whole lot of money into cash, or government bonds, or something like that, with much lower risk, and we'll cancel out with some hedge funds. Um, but other customers will go, no, 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 don't want that at all. Don't want to go above a certain point in, of asset type or risk. And we've just mentioned unacceptable asset types. Then you do get customers who have different attitudes to risk for different things. Uh, I know somebody near and dear to me uh, who has no mortgage, a share portfolio, um, a very, very secure government pension, a very much less secure ordinary pension, you can see that this sort of person doesn't have a one-track attitude to risk. Their attitude varies depending on, in this particular instance, you can see what's happening. The customer wants to be secure in their home and in their basic retirement income, but as to the rest of their money, they're happy to take quite serious risks in the hope of getting returns. It might actually be reflected on the fact how safe all their other stuff is. Their absence of debt is a reason, and their quality pension in this particular instance. And you also get customers, well, you have to find out, what, what's your view about this money? Is it Auntie Jane's inheritance money? Does that mean you want to take more risk or less risk? Some, for some people, Auntie Jane's money may be a reason to take more risk. Some preserving the capital may be of huge importance. This is a real problem at a number of different levels. Some people come along and say, look, I'm a very, very sophisticated businessman. I really, you know, hold on a second. You're talking about your sophistication at running a textile industry. You may be fantastically well acquainted with the business of oil refineries. However, you may not have any sophistication when it comes to investment. The SFC mentions numerous literacy and education for the quite good reason that they do have, to, did find... Uh, in a number of cases, um, investments of a quite sophisticated type being sold to people who are completely illiterate. But some of them actually might have been financially literate without being verbally literate. And one has to be a little careful here, but you have to assess it as the advisor. You can rely on prior investments to some degree, but do remember it's possible to missell investments twice over. So just because somebody's got something already doesn't make them suitable for it. It may have been wrong for them then and wrong for them now, or indeed right for them then and wrong for them now. And for that reason, I always say to advisors, if you've got a client who's very cautious, always put their money under the bed or in the local bank account, change slowly. In any event, if you think about it, it's much safer to do it that way. The investor gets used to a, a slightly different asset type of slightly different features. And as time goes by, they come back and say, well, yeah, that was all right. I can have some more of that. Or something like it. You know? The SFC, of course, in its original code and in its current code, stresses the need to research advisors' knowledge of derivatives before recommending anything derivative-related. 
pretty much. Give him the advice. Okay, so you've got it. Now you've got to give the advice. You can't do it sometimes. You can't give advice. You get clients who won't tell you enough information. So it's not safe to give them advice. Because you don't have enough information, actually. One of the sister documents to the SFC code, it's not in the code itself, um, but MIFID, the European Directive, says very, very clearly, if you do not have enough information to give suitable advice, you must not recommend anything. You could interpret that as being part of the best interest rule in the SFC code. It may be stretching it a bit, but you can see the idea. Please, if you are not selling from a full range of products, please don't say, this is the best product we could sell from our range. No. Don't sell anything at all, please. If you're not kitted with the right equipment, you know, it's like sort of saying, um, I need a hammer to knock that nail in. I've only got a screwdriver, I'll use that instead. Um, you can see how effective it would be. Um, but above all else, we're not in the order taking business, and you know not to churn things and be influenced by the commission payable. But this is the new know your. <laughs> Because people have always talked about know your customer, and they now do it in terms of money laundering as well. But very few people talk about know your product. And I think this may be the big one of the, the next decade, and it probably was the one of last decade as well, if anybody had been noticing. Um, but it, it's sort of the, the KY of the noughties and beyond. I don't know what the 2010s are these days uh, are called, but we have this problem of advisors putting people into products and then finding out what they're actually about and what the risks are and how it all fits together. And every bullet point I'm putting up here is, one might say, a car crash that I have witnessed. Um, you, I've seen people put money into investments where they had no idea who actually was holding them. So when the cash suddenly turned up in a margin account in the USA um, and got became a huge subject of a massive lawsuit. Um, the investor who thought they were investing in a deposit type product was somewhat upset. Um, what are the assets? What are, what's it contained in? Who do you, what do you get? Particularly important with structured products. Currency risk, you probably can work it out. If it's offshore, is the regulator reliable? There are one or two countries where they aren't. And so, it looks all right from a tax point of view. It's a fairly stupid idea from a compliance point of view. Um, and people only notice this when the money goes missing. Tax. Um, what are the problem areas? Charges. Actually, going back slightly to rights conferred by it, I, I met an unusual example of this recently. Film partnerships. Okay? For the high-risk sophisticated investor. <coughs> and they were very sophisticated, and um, the one piece of information nobody bothered to check was whether there was any right to an external audit of the partnership. They had this blockbuster film in this partnership, which still managed to make a loss. The suspicion was that the film company was dumping all its office expenses into the partnership. And what they really needed was an external audit. <coughs> 